It's one of the top tourist sites in the entire world, and I'm taking you there today. I might be in Athens at the absolute best time of year to see the most famous attractions, and I'm certain I know the best time of day to visit the Acropolis. We'll not only go to the Acropolis today, but we'll also take in this place, the ancient Agora. I'll give you my opinion on where you should go when you arrive in Athens, and possibly some places that you can skip. To begin, it's the Acropolis. The Acropolis and the Parthenon are not synonymous. Acropolis essentially means high city and so refers to the entire complex on top of the hill. The Parthenon is the most striking of the several buildings located on top of the Acropolis. Estimates vary, but the attraction draws anywhere from 3 to 7 million people each year. I arrived as soon as the gates were open at 8 a.m. I was pleasantly surprised at how few others got up at the same time to visit. There is evidence that the hill was inhabited as early as 4000 BC. The structures that are present now were built during what is known as the Golden Age of Athens in the 5th century BC. That work was commissioned by the Greek ruler Pericles. It was in celebration of victory during the Persian Wars. The Parthenon was built in tribute to the goddess Athena. It was completed after about a decade of construction, somewhere close to 438 BC. The base of the Parthenon is roughly 230 by 100 feet, and the columns rise as high as 34 feet. It has been called the finest example of Greek architecture, and has held the imagination of the public for almost 2,500 years. Standing within basically arm's reach of a place that is so revered, and that you've known about seemingly for your entire life, is slightly overwhelming. Naturally, thoughts are of the countless generations of people who have walked on this same ground and have seen the temple in good times and in bad. Not to be forgotten are those who created the structures. There were stonemasons and sculptors and architects for sure. Slaves, however, both Greek and non-Greek, provided much of the labor to transport marble from far away and put it all into place. I heard someone complaining about the scaffolding that covered the western front of the Parthenon. Those same complaints have been heard for decades. Scaffolding went up in the 1970s and 80s and has only come down on very rare occasions, one of those being when Athens hosted the Olympics in 2004. The Parthenon was damaged numerous times through the centuries during various conflicts. Some of the ever-present work is to keep what remains of the building from deteriorating farther. There are efforts underway as well to restore portions of the temple to what it looked like originally. Not everyone agrees with those practices. On the grounds around the Parthenon, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of chunks of marble that once were a part of it. You wonder if anyone has a clue in terms of where these individual pieces would fit into a very complicated puzzle. Over time, the Parthenon has served as a church and as a mosque depending on who the rulers were at the time. Seeing the columns and the walls as they are today, it's natural to think they always appeared this way. Experts, though, say that the temple was initially quite colorful and that the pigments simply faded through the centuries. I circled the Parthenon three times on my visit, each circuit discovering new vantage points and details that I had missed before. I didn't get the view of bright white marble against a clear blue Grecian flag sky. Instead, I was very pleased to have dramatic clouds as the backdrop. There are a couple of other significant buildings that join the Parthenon atop the Acropolis. The Erechtheion sits on the northern side of the site. It was a temple designed to honor Athena and Poseidon. The shape of this structure is not typical of Greek architecture of the time as it has an irregular shape. There might be a couple of reasons for that, but most likely it was related to the sharp contours of the ground on which it is situated. The interior was a bit unusual too, as different sections of the building had various uses. The Erechtheion was built during the final 20 years of the 5th century BC. Circling the temple, you can see a couple of types of columns. Probably the most well-known features are the figures which hold up the roof on the porch of the Caryatids. That's on the south side. The original statues are in museums, so the ones there now are replacements. 
To the west of the Erechtheion stands an olive tree. Legend has it that the tree was planted by Athena herself. Many say that the tree is everlasting. It's said that whenever it has incurred damage, a branch has been preserved and planted so that the tree has survived through the centuries. Its current form has grown from a planting in 1952 as a cutting was saved after the tree was harmed during World War II. Another grand monument on the Acropolis surrounds the gate through which most people enter and exit. This is called the Proplia. Its construction began as the Parthenon was nearing completion. This is massive and a fitting entrance complex for what awaits beyond on the top of the hill. In actuality, while a considerable amount of work was done on this, it was never completed. It looks remarkable for an unfinished structure. Those are the main elements that you will see on a visit to the top of the Acropolis. Other buildings and statues were once a part of the environment here. There are some remnants, but much of those other features have been lost to time. I've read that some people were not all that impressed by what they saw here. I would have to disagree. This was fascinating to me. My opinion might have been different if I had experienced this under the blazing summer sun and there had been 10 times more people packed in at the same time that I was present. Admission to the Acropolis cost 20 euros or more than $20 for most of the year. For five months during the off season, including when I was there, the fee is cut in half. That does allow access to a number of notable sites on the slopes of the hill. There are two that I will mention. The Odeon of Herodus Atticus is supremely impressive. This has a distinct Roman look and feel to it, and that can be explained by the fact that it was constructed during the second century AD. The three-story stage building features a number of Roman arches. There are 35 rows of marble seating, and it can accommodate nearly 4,700 people. The view from above shows that seating and the stage. From below, the facade of the structure presents a magnificent view as well. It is possible to get a feel for what performers on the Odeon stage experience with long arms and an extendable mount for your camera. This is still an active entertainment venue. It must be an incredible moment when joining the community of audience members who have witnessed some sort of entertainment in this historic place. Not far away are the ruins of the Theater of Dionysus. Many consider this to be the site of the first theater ever built, dating back to the 6th century BC. This theater hit its peak in the 4th century BC and at one point could hold up to 25,000 individuals. Some say this is the birthplace of the Greek tragedy. While the theater might not be nearly as impressive as the nearby Odeon, its historical significance is unparalleled. It's one of the places on the slopes of the Acropolis that people will walk by and hardly even take a moment to notice. There are so many little spots within the boundaries of the fee area that add value to the ticket that it takes for entry. Don't ignore all of these other items just to see the Parthenon and the other main attractions. That being said, my advice would be to arrive when the Acropolis opens and head straight for the top. There will be plenty of time later to check out all that the slopes have to offer. The attraction is implementing new rules. There are now restrictions on the number of people who can enter each day. When it is busiest, visitors will be assigned entry times in order to spread out the crowds over the course of the entire day. Timed entry was not in effect when I went in late November, but will be used starting in April of 2024. My tactic of going as early as possible won't be as effective in high tourist season as entry will be allowed to 3,000 people at 8 a.m. Crowds shouldn't be too much of an issue whenever visiting the ancient Agora of Athens. It is a spectacular site though that is worth a visit. Off-season pricing meant that I got in for 5 euros. Agora is a term that is translated roughly as meeting place. The ancient Agora became established as such in the 4th century BC. This is an expansive place with ruins and remnants covering the entire space. It was the heart of Athens back in the day, with all distances to and from the city measured from a particular spot within. Of particular note is the Temple of Hephaestus. It was built at the same time that the buildings at the top of the Acropolis were taking shape, being completed around 415 BC. This is one of the most well-preserved temples in all of Greece. 
All of the exterior columns are still in place, and the roof of the structure is even intact, a rarity in temples from that time period. It's a fairly compact building, measuring roughly 104 feet by 45 feet and rising to a height of 34 feet. When visiting, it is possible to get quite close to the attraction, and there are even signs imploring you not to touch the marble. This is in a corner and on the highest point within the Agora site. The Parthenon is much bigger and more famous, but for the quality of the experience, this stop is unmatched. Another phenomenal place within the Agora is the Stoa of Attalus. A Stoa is basically a covered walkway. Much longer than a football field, this Stoa was created in the 2nd century BC. It served as a marketplace with individual sellers located in lines of shops. There were two floors of activity in what could be described as an ancient shopping mall. The covered, open-air section of the stoa looks very inviting with its rows of columns. Pieces of artwork and statuary placed throughout add a great deal. This is a recreation of the market with the stoa brought back to life in the 1950s. Free with admission to the ancient agora is the museum that is housed inside the stoa. It is a linear array of attractions, with its display set out in chronological order. This is an appealing way to see artifacts that have been found inside the Agora and get a sense for what happened and when. Not so far away in a corner of the Agora is the Church of the Holy Apostles. This is a relatively intact church from the Byzantine era. It was built in the late 10th century. There is so much to see within the Agora but there is one feature that really isn't visible. This is the part of Athens where the notion of democracy was born and nurtured. It's amazing to walk through a place where an entire way of governance got its start. There remains archeological work to do in the area of the ancient Agora. I stopped for a few minutes at this site where excavations are ongoing. Digging is restricted to the summer months here in Athens in order to best preserve items that have yet to be unearthed. I visited that archaeological site and many other places during two and a half hours with New Athens Free Tour. We walked through a fair portion of the central part of Athens and I got a lot of history and was able to put a lot of what I was viewing and would later see into context. As always, I am a big proponent of free walking tours wherever I can find them. Our tour began by passing through the flea market just off of Monastiraki Square. It was just getting started for the day, but already the sights and sounds were electric. Markets such as this can be so appealing, even if you never have the intention of making a purchase. I promised earlier that I would mention some attractions that you could probably skip in terms of paying admission to get inside. I'll run through a few of those here and show what can be seen without opening your wallet. This is Hadrian's Library, which is adjacent to the Agora. It was built in the second century AD. There was a library, of course, but also areas for recreation and relaxing. Back at that time, it seems, education was viewed as a leisure activity. Another site that requires an admission fee that you can look at from afar is the Roman Forum or Roman Agora. This was funded by Julius Caesar in the first century BC and was the center of Athens society during Roman rule. Within this attraction is the Tower of the Winds, it is considered a key relic of the creation of the science of meteorology. I had a lengthy inner debate about paying to get into this site. It's the Panathenaic Stadium. Apparently, this is the only stadium in the world that is made entirely of marble. It was built in the second century AD. This was the birthplace of the modern Olympic Games in 1896. It was even where the men's and women's marathons ended in the 2004 Summer Olympic Games. This was a tough call, but ultimately I thought that 10 euros was a bit much for going inside to walk on the track and sit in the stands for a few moments. It was a bit easier to skip the Olympion site, which is the home of the ruins of the Temple of Olympian Zeus. This was a wide open space with some cool looking columns rising into the sky. The place was dominated, however, by scaffolding when I wandered through the area. Right next to that attraction is Hadrian's Arch. It's an impressive gateway that was created in the second century AD to honor the Roman Emperor Hadrian, who actually became a citizen of Athens. This is a non-ticketed attraction that spanned a road which linked the Temple of Zeus and the Acropolis. 
At the very end of my tour, my guide Walter suggested that I take a short hike up to the top of Philippopolis Hill. Great suggestion because there are 360 degree views here, a really good view of the Acropolis, and you get a sense for how big this city is. You could even see to the Mediterranean. At the top of the hill, which is also called the Hill of the Muses, there is a monument. It is a burial tribute to Philippopolis, who died in the second century AD. That monument is striking but the appeal of the hill for me centered on the views. It never gets old rising high above the city to gain a new vantage point. Farther down the slopes of the hill is a site off of the main path that is hailed as the prison of Socrates. Socrates was imprisoned and sentenced to death around the turn of the fourth century BC for among other things, corruption of youth and worshiping a deity that was not recognized by the leaders at that time. Most certainly, however, this is not the place where he was held. That would have most likely been somewhere within the Agora. I accessed all of these sites by using the incredible Athens metro system. It is easy to navigate and it is an expensive way to move around the city. Several metro stations are situated in the vicinity of these main attractions. The cars can become fairly crowded at times and as everyone here will tell you, protect your belongings as pickpocketing is a risk. Look into three or five day metro passes which give you the opportunity to ride as much as you want in those given periods. One of the main access points for my adventures was Monastiraki Square. It is a thriving, exciting location which even contains its own bit of history. The Church of Pantanasa is a 10th century structure that was part of the monastery which gave Monastiraki its name. This is a very tourist-heavy part of the city. Numerous restaurants line the streets that radiate out from the square. I did not eat at any of them, but I did stop in at a place called Sicinelli. I sat for a while after my visit to the Acropolis and before I went to the ancient Agora. They took great care with my cappuccino and I enjoyed the break to relax and refuel. All around the central part of the city, there are a variety of street performers. I thought this guy was really good. I've seen images and videos of the crowds that swarm these attractions in the summer, and I know that at that time of year, temperatures regularly exceed 100 degrees. If at all possible, come here during the period between the 1st of November and the end of March. Crowds during this time are more manageable. It's infinitely more comfortable to see the sights, and prices are actually lower. I'll have plenty more from Athens and Greece over the next several weeks here on Old, Alone, and Far From Home. Come back and join me for all that. It's going to be fun.